Tonight, relentless onslaught. Gazans seeking shelter reel from the impact of Israeli strikes that rendered dozens dead and many more injured. Business as usual. Modi prepares for inauguration for the third time. However, there's a damper on the celebrations as a supermajority remains a dream. Remembering D-Day. Global leaders pay their respects to the fallen and the veterans of the fateful Normandy landings 80 years on. And triumph for Trump. The former president sees a legal victory in Georgia as his criminal election interference case is put on hold indefinitely. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Anuvarna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for tuning in tonight on World News. We have lots of fresh updates to bring to you and we begin with yet more information on the Israel-Palestine conflict. An Israeli airstrike on a UN school packed with hundreds of displaced Palestinians in central Gaza has reportedly killed at least 35 people. It was reported that a warplane fired two missiles at classrooms on the top floor of the school in the urban Nuziriat refugee camp. Videos showed the destruction and a number of strewn bodies. Israel targeted a Gaza school on Thursday that it said contained a Hamas compound. Israel said it killed fighters involved in the October 7th attack that sparked the eight-month war. Gaza media said the strike killed at least 27 people seeking shelter at the United Nations school in Nusseret in central Gaza. Video obtained by Reuters showed bodies being carried away from the rubble. Hamas-run media rejected Israel's claims that the school had hidden a command post of the militant group. Israel's military said that before the strike by Israeli fighter jets, the military took steps to reduce the risk of harm to civilians. Eyewitnesses said the attack took them by surprise. The attack came after Israel announced a new military campaign in central Gaza, as it battles a group of fighters relying on hit-and-run insurgency tactics. Israel has said there will be no halt to fighting during ceasefire talks. On Wednesday, in an apparent blow to a truce proposal last week from U.S. President Joe Biden, the leader of Hamas said the group would demand a permanent end to the war in Gaza and Israeli withdrawal as part of a ceasefire plan. Washington had said it was waiting to hear an answer from Hamas to what Biden described as an Israeli initiative. Since a brief week-long truce in November, all attempts to arrange a ceasefire have failed. Hamas insists on a permanent end to the conflict, while Israel says it is prepared to discuss only temporary pauses until the militant group is defeated. And over in India, Modi is preparing to be sworn in this Saturday on the 8th of June. Meanwhile, the results of India's general election are being interpreted in a rather unusual way. While the winners appear subdued, the runners-up are celebrating. The NDA alliance, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, has won a historic third term in power with more than 290 seats in the 543-member parliament. But his Bharatiya Janata Party on its own did not reach the magic figure of 272 seats needed to form the government. And the Prime Minister is now being seen as a much diminished leader. Global leaders are preparing to fly into the nation for Modi's integration on the 8th of June. The election outcome is being seen as a huge comeback for the opposition India Alliance and Congress Party leader Rahul Gandhi, the face of the bloc. The alliance has won just over 230 seats and doesn't have the numbers to cobble together a government. But more than 24 hours after counting of votes began, they were yet to concede. According to the public, the opposition has managed to pull off the unexpected. A jubilant Congress party called the verdict a moral and political defeat for Mr. Modi, whose BJP had campaigned predominantly on his name and record. Mr. Gandhi told a press conference that the country has anonymously sent a message to Mr. Modi and Home Minister Amit Shah that they do not want their leadership. And there is continued tensions in the Korean Peninsula as North Korea has reportedly started removing parts of the Donghae Line railroad that connects the Gongansan Mountains. In the meantime, South Korea's military will also soon resume exercises near the northwestern islands. North Korea is reportedly showing another move to erase the idea of reunification. 
On Wednesday, South Korea's National Intelligence Service said there are some signs of the removal of the tracks of the Tongan Line Railroad and that they are keeping an eye on the related events. No further details were provided by the intelligence agency. A senior unification ministry official told that the removal of the tracks had likely been carried out in line with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's direct orders earlier this month. Back in January at the Supreme People's Assembly, the North's leader ordered to disconnect the South and North as part of the regime's efforts to eliminate the idea of reunification. The railroad, according to the ministry official, was connecting Chejin Station on South Korea's east coast to North Korea's Mount Kumgang as a symbol of connecting the two Koreas. Pyongyang has recently been spotted removing streetlights and planting landmines in roads connecting the South and North. Meanwhile, taking the government decision to suspend all clauses of the 2018 inter-Korean military agreement, the South Korean military will soon resume drills in areas near the military demarcation line and the Northwest Islands. According to officials, Marines deployed to the Northwest Islands will resume their K-9 self-propelled artillery drills this month for the first time in nearly six years. Army drills within five kilometers of the MDL and near the northern limit line would also resume shortly. Seoul's decision to suspend the military agreement came on Tuesday amid North Korea's continued provocations. And still in the region, we see some bolstering of international bonds. An alliance involving South Korea, the United States, Japan and India, as well as the European Union, has been launched to put joint efforts to build a resilient supply chain in the biopharmaceutical sector. South Korea, the United States and Japan have agreed to explore ways to jointly invest in critical minerals and have formed a biopharmaceutical coalition with India and the European Union. This came as the three countries on Wednesday held their fourth round of economic security talks on supply chains, core emerging technologies, digital technology and infrastructure security. Wang Yunjong, third deputy director of Korea's National Security Council, held a regular dialogue in San Diego, California, with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts, Tarun Chabra and Yatsu Takamura. They agreed to explore ways to jointly invest in core minerals and strengthen cooperation in policies related to data security and digital infrastructure. The three countries also formed a public-private biopharma coalition with India and the EU as an expansion of the first Korea-U.S. dialogue on core emerging technologies last year. The group will aim to reduce vulnerabilities in the biopharmaceutical supply chain by cooperating on advanced manufacturing technology and coordinating on measures to diversify their raw material sources. The world commemorates D-Day today. Events are taking place in France and the UK to mark the 80th anniversary of the Allied invasion of France. Five years ago, 225 veterans traveled to Normandy for the commemorations, and this year there were just 23. World leaders addressed the gathering in solemn remembrance. For updates, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Pawni Sinara Mudaligay from Essex in the UK. What do you have for us, Pawni? Yes, Anuradi, US President Joe Biden and King Charles are among world leaders attending ceremonies. Commemorations are also taking place at the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire for UK veterans unable to return to France. Britain's King Charles, Prince William and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak attended the DTA National Commemoration event in Portsmouth. Speaking to an audience that included DTA veterans, Charles highlighted the privilege he felt in hearing stories of courage, resilience and solidarity from those who took part in the attack that helped defeat Nazi Germany in World War II. Prince William said he was deeply honoured to be joined by guests at the ceremony who had helped fight against tyranny. After the ceremony, the royals, including Queen Camilla and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, listened to stories from the veterans. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Pawani Singh Haram Mudalige from Essex in the UK. And over in Russia, the onslaught continues, this time with more warnings, as President Vladimir Putin has warned that Russia could provide long-range weapons to others to strike Western targets in response to NATO allies allowing Ukraine to use their arms to attack Russian territory. This is the Buk M1, a medium-range surface-to-air missile system that comes from Russia. 
On Wednesday, Russia's Defence Ministry released this footage showing the system being deployed alongside an anti-tank gun and a D-30 howitzer. In what they've said is in the zone of a so-called special military operation in the Donetsk district in Ukraine. Russia reportedly produces nearly 3 million munitions a year to arm their artillery, firing around 10,000 shells a day, compared to 2,000 from Ukraine. It's an advantage President Vladimir Putin is determined to keep. Speaking to international news agencies in St Petersburg on Wednesday, he said that it would mark a dangerous step for Western nations to allow Ukraine to use their weapons to strike targets inside Russia. If they consider it possible to deliver such weapons to the combat zone, to launch strikes on our territory and create problems for us, why don't we have the right to supply such weapons of the same type to some regions of the world where they can be used to launch strikes on sensitive facilities of the countries that do it to Russia? He spoke particularly of Germany, who recently joined the United States in allowing Ukraine to use the long-range weapons that they are supplying to Kiev on Russian targets which, according to Putin, would completely destroy their international relations and undermine international security. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. It's a triumph for Trump as Georgia appeals court in the U.S. passed pause the criminal election interference case against Donald Trump in the state. This suspension will remain in effect until a decision is made regarding his attempt to disqualify the district attorney handling the case. This, this, this development makes it highly unlikely that a trial will occur before the U.S. presidential election in November of this year. Donald Trump's Georgia election interference case is on hold indefinitely, according to a court order Wednesday, while an appeals court hears the former president's attempt to disqualify the lead prosecutor, Fannie Willis. It is the latest indication that this case, one of four facing Trump as he seeks to unseat President Joe Biden and return to the White House, will not go to trial before the November 5th presidential election. Trump and eight co-defendants allege Willis had a conflict of interest being involved in a romantic relationship with a former top deputy whom she hired to work on the probe. A Georgia appeals court earlier scheduled to hear arguments in October whether to remove her. Trump and 14 co-defendants have pleaded not guilty to racketeering and other charges in what prosecutors allege was a scheme to overturn Trump's narrow defeat in Georgia in the 2020 election. Legal challenges also bogged down two other federal cases against Trump, one on Trump trying to overturn his defeat, and the other his mishandling of classified documents after leaving office. Last week, Trump became the first former US president to be convicted of a felony over his hush money case involving porn star Stormy Daniels. Trump has vowed to appeal that verdict. On the road to the White House tonight, the outcome of the presidential election likely hinges on six purple states President Joe Biden won in 2020. But he trails former President Donald Trump in all of them right now, according to polling averages, with less than six months before the November general election. In Arizona, Trump leads by four points, according to polling averages that show him beating Biden, who won the state by fewer than 11,000 votes in 2020. In Georgia, Trump is up 4.8 points in the state, showing Trump winning by the latest three points. In Michigan, after winning by three points in 2020, Biden trails Trump who won Michigan in 2016 by half a point. Biden also won in Nevada by three points in 2020, but polls this year show Trump wouldn't beat him by 5.4 points. In Pennsylvania, Trump holds a 2.3 average lead and is ahead in all but one of eight polls dating back to April 11th, including the polling average, after Biden won the state by one point in 2020, flipping Trump's 2016 win. Wisconsin is Trump's narrowest lead of any swing state, 0.1 points. Biden beat Trump by less than one point in Wisconsin in 2020 after Trump won the state in 2016. <laughs> A 
And while there's a legal win for Trump, the Bidens can't seem to say the same. Hunter Biden's ex-girlfriend has told a jury that he was abusing crack cocaine every 20 minutes or so when they first met. The U.S. president's son is on trial in Williamton, Delaware on charges related to his possession of a firearm while allegedly using narcotics in a national first. Hunter Biden's former girlfriend testified Wednesday at his criminal trial about his near-constant crack cocaine use. Prosecutors are trying to prove that he lied about his drug addiction to illegally buy a handgun in the first trial of a U.S. president's child. Zoe Keston told jurors Hunter Biden would want to smoke as soon as he woke up and spent days in hotel rooms getting high in the months before his 2018 gun purchase. Earlier, Hunter Biden's ex-wife Kathleen Buell, who divorced him in 2017, also testified about how she first discovered he was using drugs. Prosecutors claim Hunter Biden knowingly lied about his drug use on screening paperwork. He has pleaded not guilty to three felony charges accusing him of failing to disclose his use of illegal drugs when he bought the gun and of illegally possessing the weapon for 11 days. Hunter Biden has publicly acknowledged his past drug use, though his defense lawyer Abby Lowell has countered that Hunter Biden was not using drugs at the time of the gun purchase and did not intend to deceive. Lowell pressed an FBI agent to acknowledge that prosecutors' evidence of addiction came before or after the gun ownership. The trial follows another historic first, last week's criminal conviction of Donald Trump, the first former U.S. president to be found guilty of a felony. Trump is the Republican challenger to Democrat Joe Biden in the November 5th election. Yet more legal updates now as a jury has found that Johnson & Johnson must pay about 260 million U.S. dollars to a woman who said she got mesothelioma, a deadly cancer linked to asbestos exposure, from inhaling the company's talc powder. The verdict comes as the company continues to pursue a proposed $6.48 billion settlement of most talc-related lawsuits against it through a prepackaged bankruptcy. American multinational pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson was ordered by an Oregon court on Monday to pay 260 million US dollars in damages to a woman who said she developed a deadly cancer linked to asbestos exposure from the company's talcum powder. The plaintiff, 49-year-old Kyung Lee, was diagnosed with mesothelioma last year which she claims is a result of inhaling asbestos-tainted talc for over 30 years. While Johnson & Johnson affirmed that its talc products do not contain asbestos or cause cancer, citing scientific studies, the company is facing over 61,000 talc-related lawsuits while it continues to pursue a proposed $6.48 billion deal to settle some of the claims. We're going in for a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Before we wrap up, here are some updates on the ongoing T20 World Cup matches now. Over the matches that occurred today, we saw some exciting developments. Marcus Stoinis produced a fine all-round show as Australia got off to a winning start by 39 runs, defeating Oman in Barbados in a Group B clash. Meanwhile, a hard-fought three-wicket win on a challenging pitch gave Uganda their maiden win at the T20 World Cup. They beat Papua New Guinea in a low-scoring game in Guanya, where both teams vied for their first ever win in the competition. 2021 champions Australia got their 2024 T20 World Cup campaign off to a winning start against Oman. A decent test for Australia in the end as it was a hard-fought time, especially in the first 12 overs of Oman's bowling effort. Marcus Stoinis's six hitting got them a decent score and despite some plucky batting throughout, Oman were never really in contention. Australia got to the top of Group B with that win. They've got two points as have Namibia but an inferior run rate. England and Scotland have won apiece and Oman perhaps deserved to be on more than a rotund zero. 
And in the Uganda vs Papua New Guinea match, Uganda's bowlers and Rizat steal their first win in T20 World Cup history. PNG's bowlers gave some hope after they folded for their lowest T20I score ever, but Uganda held their nerve in the end. PNG's batting crumbled to 77 all out after being put to bat, before Uganda, themselves in trouble at 26 for 5, reached home in the 19th over. Rizat Al Shah, one of Uganda's rising stars, used a low backlift in his careful 33 all. 56 to shepherd them through the tricky chase, falling just shy of three runs of Uganda's targets. PNG were left to rue their poor batting, but they also conceded 15 wides, the second biggest contribution on the scorecard. And on the ongoing match, Pakistan versus the USA, Pakistan entered the ICC T20 World Cup 2024 on the back of a tumultuous period on and off the field. And their former leading pace bowler Omar Gul believes the chaotic preparations will hamper the team's performance at the tournament. And that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Stay tuned as Sina Mayadani will join you in just a moment with the nightly business report. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.